Hello and a very warm welcome to the new episode of Digital Transformation Dialogues brought to you by Dassault Systems in association with Economic Times. Technology is playing a key role in everyone's life, impacting the way we live, eat, communicate or move. Modern transportation, which is also known as mobility, is being disrupted by digital technologies on various fronts, be it product design, development, manufacturing, powertrain or marketing. Today we are at 75 year old commercial vehicle manufacturers Ashok Leyland Technical Center to understand how digital technologies are being implemented and how the company is mitigating the risk to become future ready to further enlighten us and to take us through the digital transformation journey we have Dr N Sarvanan who is chief technical officer of Ashok Leyland and he leads the team of 1500 engineers and heads the research and development work for the company Dr. Shivan, pleasure, 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 pleasure meeting How is it going for you? Uh, going well, going well. It's a hot day, but yeah. going well. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you know, we are talking about here digital transformation of Ashok Leyland. Uh, but first of all, the question comes to my mind is, you know, I've been to the Auto Expo, so, and you have showcased so many mm. different technologies of different power trains. How did you manage to do that, and how it is panning out for the company as well as seeing the global scheme of things? I think uh, good observation. You did see us showcase the entire range, and it's for a reason. Uh, just to showcase the entire stakeholders that decarbonization in commercial vehicles is not a straightforward solution. It's not about just moving from diesel to EV and so on. Mind-boggling number of combinations possible. We have CNG, LNG as an option. You also have hydrogen as a fuel, both from a fuel cell and hydrogen ice, and also a BEV. So we want to showcase to the world that we are ready. And how is it we got ready? I think uh, the, we had to go back a few years when we introduced the modular platform. If you notice, the, most of the products we had on the Auto Expo were based on the modular platform. The modularity helps us achieve things right. much faster and lower cost. That was sort of the right. uh, secret uh, for right. the better. At but the you end know, of so it. much com complications and you know the confusion towards the we don't know what will the future mm. of fuel for commercial vehicles. How do you think you know digital technology will help a company like Ashur Leyland? to reduce time, cost, uh, you know, and help engineers. So I think, how do you apportion the limited investment you have in a very, very frugal manner? I think that's where digital plays a role. By digital, if you can cut down the development cost, if you can cut down the development time, you can do a lot more things faster with less cost. And I think that's where the core of digital comes in. At the same time, by re removing all the non-value activities, it improves the speed of development. Right. One more thing I want to understand from you, because these digital technologies, you know, engineers need to be trained. So how are you managing all those things, especially when it comes to suppliers also? Mm. So overall, uh, you know, stakeholders, how do you see that? It is true. Some technologies, some parts of digitalization is a lot more challenging, both in terms of time it takes, the change management in terms of convincing people. If, for example, if I tell them instead of doing a physical prototype, you do a digital prototype and then you have to learn new skills to be able to check things in digital prototype, it's a little bit more challenging because they feel there's new things to learn, maybe they'll be prone to mistakes and so on. What we do is a combination of, one is training them well, yeah. right? explain to them the benefits and initial stages of a rollout, uh, we make sure we don't penalize people for right. doing something wrong. Right. Always, uh, as long as they try, we, we give them benefit of the doubt. And that's from a, from a general perspective, that's what we do. Um, I think from a supplier perspective, much more uh, complicated. There are a lot of suppliers in the ecosystem, tier one to tier three. Uh, we're seeing a lot of tier one suppliers actually are already on this path. But the challenge remains the, how, how is that I can build uh, digital transparency across the entire supply chain? So I think this is still a work in progress. It's not there completely, I think. But there are definitely suppliers who are uh, doing a really good job in terms of uh, Digitalization. This brings me to a question, you know, how many technologies, digital technologies, you know, you particularly use huh. in, when, you know, when it comes from a full product life cycle, you know, uh, be it from the design point uh. of view, from the simulation, manufacturing, you know, getting the final product out in the market. So, how many digital technologies, you know, <laughs> I, would, I, would, like a I don't know, maybe 20 plus, I just to give you an example, right? So, if you start, if your design starts at the a sketching level, right? Yeah. Design, and there's a couple of software that we use there. Then it gets into concept 
uh, stage development where we have some very, very basic tools we use to be able to flush out uh, the concepts. Then goes in detailed design. We use tools like Katia, for example. But even there, there are two options. We have Katia, one more software from engine perspective. Then we go into simulation, uh, where we, depending on the simulation you want to, structural versus fluid versus uh, something else, we have a lot more combination of tools. Then it goes to uh, testing. A whole bunch of digital tools come into play there. And then something that combines all this and data availability, that's one more tool. Right. Then we go into feasibility of manufacturing and serviceability. Again, we use tools to check for digitally the, right. and then it goes into manufacturing itself. There's a whole bunch of tools that they use uh, for uh, simulation and all that. Then, of course, in the marketing phase, I think I would say easily 2025 is what comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah. So in your view, you know, it's, it's, it's become easy for you to manage the team of 1500 engineers that you're leading because you know there was a time when covid was there you know mm. when people were working from home so what was your you know your your overview overview on this particular digital transformation that uh, if there are non believers in the transformation that a digital technology can bring in uh, i think they became believers during covid i mean we just shut down one day and said we have 3 hours of gap you can take whatever machines you want take it home we'll figure out what to do and i personally thought oh there goes what our productivity right we'll just be doing something that is periphery we can't do real uh, then we realized that uh, a lot can be done when there's a constraint right and we had the right tools luckily we had the right tools uh, what we used to do physically in terms of uh, prototypes and so on start doing digitally initially it seemed like we're taking a risk but then we realized we are actually doing things faster we're able to collaborate much faster because everybody was available virtually. Even simple things like everybody getting on Teams or Zoom, it was not what we did before, the physical means. So starting from there to be able to use digital tools, to be able to work across functions, use digital tools, modify them to be able to use, use for the purpose you wanted. I think, the whole, or the, I think that six to nine months was eye-opener for us. So when people came back, initially they were reluctant to go to physical meetings. And they were like sitting and seeing virtual tools, they wanted to use virtual. Right. So now it's a trade-off. Right. The right balance between the virtual tools versus physical. But I think it's, a, it's I think in one sense, it's been good for us and I open it for a lot of people. So before going to the next question, please tell us about, you know, what you're working on currently and what are the new things at Ashok Leland? Instead of me talking, let me just take you to the Photoshop where you can see them in physical. So why do you head towards the Photoshop? I want to understand, you know, when it comes to the product development, can you give some specific examples, you know, since we have talked about so many different power trains, mm -hmm. you know, how this digital technology enabled you to reduce time, cost, mm -hmm. save the man mm -hmm. hours. So, give some ex specific examples so that, you know, audience can understand about, you know, how digital technology really impacts an OEM, which is a 75-year-old yeah. heritage history. No, I think, uh, uh, if you look at product development, uh, what typically happens is the main development happens in powertrain, which is the engine, gearbox, and the axle, and so on. If in all these new technologies, a key change is in terms of the powertrain. Uh, you might have a diesel engine in one vehicle, next vehicle you may have a CNG, other might you have a hydrogen ice vehicle. So start focusing on the engine development itself. In the engine development itself, instead of just by testing and testing and testing and qualifying and saying what are the change required. We use a lot of upfront digital tools. How does the components that I change? What do I need to change to convert engine from a diesel to a CNG? What do I, it may include a simple combustion analysis. Again, all digital tools. Then instead of actually validating it physically a lot, we say we have a lot of data from diesel. Can that data be somehow used to get some inference about what could happen in CNG and hydrogen ice and so on and so forth. That is, that is one level. Second, then you look at the periphery component, right? If you have engine, you have a cooling system, air intake. A lot of simulation goes into saying, how do I size this component? What is the uh, airflow required and so on? That happens. And then comes the vehicle. Uh, from a vehicle design, what is the impact of putting this engine in terms of drivability? How does it drive? What will be the engage performance because of the engine noise levels being high or low depending on the fuel and so on? Uh, the change doesn't happen later on in the process. It happens up front. Okay, let's head towards the proto shop to understand better on how the commercial vehicle industry is working on. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I 
want to understand, you know, we have talked about digital technologies impacting OEMs like Ashok Leyland and suppliers. But how does it impact the life of the customer, especially the drivers? I think uh, what's happened over the last uh, three, four years, a lot of the OEMs have looked at how do I look at what's happening actually in the vehicles once it goes out of production. Right? It's entirely possible now with the data we have in telematics to say, how is a driver driving my vehicle? Is he driving it harshly? Is he driving it in the most efficient manner? Is he driving it safe? And there are also, along with that, if you have inbuilt cameras, you can also say, is it a driver a drowsy? Uh, is he driving too harshly? Or if there's an accident, you can almost because of the accident. So I think a lot of ways, such tools have helped us not to penalize anybody, but to understand, because if you look at a customer perspective, one of the biggest costs is a fuel cost. So if you can tell, if you can tell the customer, just by driving this vehicle in this route with this load in a certain way, uh, I can actually improve fuel economy 5%. And I can do that digitally because I'm capturing all the data where the driver is driving. I can show him that instead of driving this way, if you drive it this way, you can actually get a fuel economy. So there's one example of how uh, a digital technology uh, with all the data is available to us can be used to help the driver drive much better. Much better also impacts his pocketbook. A lot of the owners reward the drivers based on the fuel economy and so on. So that impacts quite a bit. So. Yeah. So fleet owners are also getting a lot of you know benefit from this implementation of these digital technologies when we talk about. Uh, how Ashok Leyland is working to make fleet owners more enabled towards you know for the better business models or the better better business environment. So I think yeah if you, if you look at look at this telematics units as a platform. It is one side, it helps the fleet owners not just simple trace and track the vehicle, it's one side, but also looking at and saying, if I can link the vehicle to a large, uh, if, if the if customer is small, he won't attach his fleet to a larger fleet customer, it helps you integrate from an ERP perspective, the vehicle can, so that the vehicle can be tracked by the larger uh, fleet owner. If, they, if he wants to work with a logistics uh, provider, uh, if you want to sort of, uh, from a load perspective, he can link up digitally with them, there is one aspect of it. Second aspect is in terms of monitoring uh, things like fuel theft, fuel economy, that makes it much easier. Third is monitoring his asset. In the longer term, just think of the scenario where, if I can use the data and tell the bank that is given the loan to the customer, Look at this vehicle, it is being utilized 90% of the time and the loads are quite high. And therefore, the risk to you as the bank is lower with this customer. Can you consider giving the customer certain basis points, better loan rates, right? That's one example. Similarly, if you can say, this vehicle, because I've trained the driver, is being driven quite safely by the drivers, or the entire field has been done that way. If I can show the data to the insurance company and say, you know what, hey, this is a lower risk from, a, from your perspective, why can you give a lower insurance? So these are things that can happen over time. And that's the whole beauty of having the entire platform. Okay. That's a good one. So now we are at the Protoshop. We'd like to understand what is the Photoshop is all about from a short period. Yeah, so I think good, we've been talking about Photoshop for <laughs> the entire discussion. I think Photoshop is short for prototype shop, where we make prototypes. Uh, what happens in the development cycle is you start with styling, you do the detail design, and there comes a point in the development cycle where you actually have to say, how does this vehicle perform, at least in the control environment that we'll put it through, yeah, as, a, as an example. We also need to build prototypes, which are, prototype basically means you are you're putting together a vehicle, not necessarily in the manufacturing line, but uh, it is design intent in terms of what, what the parts are. We make, make parts in the lower volumes and then put them together uh, in this shop, where actually instead of a conveyor line, we have bays and engineers put together vehicles in very, very small volume, maybe five, 10 vehicles at a time. And these are typically used for not just some validation from a uh, durability perspective, there are some uh, things like ride and handling, NVS, and sometimes for allocation purposes. That's, that's, that's the Photoshop. Yeah. 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 So now, coming back to the industry, spe specifically the commercial vehicle industry, and there are you know, now around a handful of manufacturers in India, and globally, you know, there are a lot of players. 
Uh, when we talk about digital technologies, so is commercial vehicle industry is ready to implement it fully? And can you paint, like what's your vision for 2025? And can you paint a picture in, from that? So for us, inherently, all uh, commercial vehicle OEMs have to be uh, very, very frugal, uh, very, very agile in terms of uh, product development cycle, getting it to market, more importantly, understanding what's happening and being able to tweak the product further. Because ultimately, for the customer, it is a machine that makes him a living, right? right. So in my view, actually commercial vehicle manufacturers are probably uh, more apt right. to adopting tools that give them the agility and frugality. And I think digital is uh, one way to uh, do it. From an overall roadmap, I think everybody's looking at it. There are some challenges. While it's easier to do in the back end, uh, for example, from engineering, making it more digital, uh, sourcing, making it more digital, in the plants, making it more digital, it is in your control. Now, when it goes into marketing, uh, it also depends on how savvy the customer is. You are seeing in the passenger vehicle segment, customers are actually already savvy. Uh, a lot of the purchasing decisions are getting made by looking, uh, looking at the vehicle virtually on the web. A lot of research happening on the web. Is it happening in the commercial vehicle? Not yet, because still uh, there is this question of what is the right, right vehicle variant for that application. But I think it will change. Uh, you're starting to see a little bit more AI driven configurators, which actually, if a customer gives applications, able to recommend the right product for the customer, it will happen. The next step, of course, is uh, more and more of digital, I would say, I wouldn't say digital dealerships. There'll be a mix, because ultimately customers will want to still see some vehicles. A lot of the service diagnostics is definitely moving towards digital. From a roadmap, I think in the next five years, you'll see significant changes, not just inside, but how the customer sees the entire vehicle. One last question. Ashok Leland is pretty much prepared with all kind of fuel types, as well as going be it electric, ethanol, methanol, hydrogen. Uh, but uh, when it comes to the you know overall sales and overall business, uh, how do you make Ashok Leland future ready? I think there are two, two levers to it. One is, one is we have to, con I mean, while you talk about technologies, uh, there is a certain transition time that's going to happen. Is diesel going to die? No. It's going to be at least 10, 15 years. So we continue to invest in making diesel much more efficient, a much better performance, at the same time bringing down a cost structure. Yeah. That will improve profitability. Once you are profitable, that's what we can invest in the future. Uh, the future, uh, since it's unknown in terms of what will happen when, we need to continue to invest. So question of be efficient here in the core, take the efficiency, put as investments into the future. And I think in the future we have, we believe, a couple of advantages over other OEMs. Uh, particularly we have a modular platform. Uh, we also one of the very few OEMs that has a core engine technology in-house. And, and the combination of this along with our, I think a long, uh, I would say, inherent um, bias that we always are very innovative. We always been trying to be frugal. I think that, that, that passion uh, will uh, hopefully help us do, make, bring things out much, much uh, faster. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you very much. much.